All right. Oh, there you go. Now, this is great. Uh, so all the panelists as well, uh, Cecilia, Jarvis, Jenny, if you're so kind, those two, yeah. So we can all see our faces. Now, this is more like it. Um, so for the sake of brevity, we have already introduced our, our panelists during uh, the presentations, um, but we have three more experts in the matter. Uh, and if, if you all allow me to say so, uh, three of the biggest experts in the uh, area of data-driven learning, uh, they need not a, a very um, uh, extensive introduction, seeing as uh, we all tend to cite them extensively a lot in our in our works, uh, but here we have uh, Dr. Pascual Perez Paredes, a professor at the University of Murcia. Um, he's he's interested in in data driven learning, corpora, applied linguistics. His interest is widespread all around, and he's a very active researcher. Uh, one of the best, if you ask me, but I have a, a personal interest in that. And uh, <laughs> he says no, and he's he's too uh, he's too humble to uh, admit that. Uh, we also have Alex Bolton, another one of the, one of the best around in the in the field. Uh, he's also uh, he's set in the uh, University of Lorraine. Um, he's interested as well in data driven learning and how to implement it into into the um, average user, as we mentioned before, and how uh, new technologies play a role in, in implementing data-driven learning, also cited extensively in every one of our uh, attempts at papers. Um, and also Elisa Corino. Yes, last but not least, she is a, a professor at the University of Torino and her research interested in language acquisition, corpus linguistics, data driven learning, CLIL, content integrated language learning. Uh, uh, she has participated in lots of different uh, national and international prog uh, projects. Uh, again, uh, you basically find her, if you, especially if you work in on Italian, uh, it's a key word, key person uh, for uh, for me, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so and in international literature as well, uh, with all the interest she has. So thank you very much for joining us uh, on this webinar. Uh, hopefully, we can have a fruitful discussion now about all these uh, new, interesting, careful. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, ideas and uh, uh, on data-driven learning. Yes, I will keep an eye on the chat if uh, people want to provide their own insights and their own questions to the to the panel. Uh, but I guess uh, we should start with the biggest elephant in the room. Uh, so DDL and the newest technologies. Uh, what do you think the impact of, let's say, and I and I will choose artificial intelligence, because that's the most prominent currently. How do you think uh, tools like artificial intelligence can affect how DDL is uh, perceived and how DDL can be implemented? Who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> I just throw around the question. Nobody else wants to. <laughs> Can I? All right, there you please, go. Please go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um, we, we had this question for a different generation. Why should we use a corpus, not a dictionary? Because a dictionary can do some things a corpus can't. And a corpus can do some things a dictionary can't. So with ChatGPT we need, or, or other BARD and other tools as well, user strengths. Um, it doesn't do the same things as DDL. So use DDL when DDL is appropriate and use ChatGPT when ChatGPT is appropriate. I saw a paper, I think it was Phoebe Lynn, <clears throat> and she was looking at how to get concordances out of ChatGPT, um, which is very interesting, but I don't think it's the best way to go about it. If you want concordances, use a concordance. ChatGPT can do other things, and that's what we should be using it for. So it's too early. It's only been out for a year. 
this type of tool really. So we'll know more in the next year, two years, five years. But I have no particular worries at the moment that <coughs> excuse me, DDL is not going to go away because ChatGPT is very good if you want to get a finished product. If you need to write an email or to write a talk or something like that, fine. Okay. With DDL, you have to do a lot of work. It doesn't do it for you. That's the advantage and the disadvantage of DDL. If you, if you just want a result, it's a lot of work to get there. But if you want to think about it so you actually learn by going through the processes of thinking and induction and all the rest of it, that's a strength of DDL as well. It's like when you correct students' homework, you might spend hours and hours annotating their, their written work, you give it back to them. If they look at their corrections, they can learn a lot. If they just say, oh, I got a B, put it in the bag and forget it, there's no learning happening. So use the strengths of ChatGPT when it's appropriate and use the strengths of uh, corpus linguistics when that's appropriate or a dictionary or other tools. That's me. What, what's your take on, uh, on that? Yeah, maybe, okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, you have a on this? Yeah, no, I, I fully agree with Alex. Uh, what I think it's um, what Sylvia yeah. showed us, so how to use um, artificial intelligence to produce text, because one of the big, uh, say, disadvantages of, or not disadvantages, but the, the issues with EDL is that we have different learners with different levels. And corpora are fuzzy sometimes are very difficult to find um ready to use corpora suited for each and every level and using like semi um oh, wait, 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 as alex wrote in the chat um semi authentic produced text might help might help really help us in in creating ad hoc corpora or at least a small sets of materials, not really maybe not a corpus because corpus is big set of data, but some elements in, in, and um, uh, materials that, that we could use and then exploit with a data-driven learning path. Yeah, I thought it was a very interesting idea of Sylvia's there. The question of whether it's authentic data, because that's when people talk about data-driven learning, they talk about authentic language as being one of the strong points. Um, on the other hand, some people have done research, for example, on using graded readers. And if you're using learner corpora, mostly they come from exam situations. How authentic is that? So I'm open. If it can be useful, use it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Jarvis wanted to. Uh, if I can give my two cents on the on on the discussions, uh, especially regarding the authenticity of uh, text generated by ChatGPT. So we know that, um, I mean, one of the strengths of data-driven learning or, or using corpus for language teaching is the linguistic authenticity, cultural authenticity, and functional authenticity. So um, even though ChatGPT might be uh, trained on authentic data, but the language it produced, it might very well, I mean, it will resemble a lot like the language we produce uh, in language textbook for language teaching because it doesn't have... Uh, the functional and cultural authenticity. As far as I'm concerned, ChatGPT is created, and and I mean they have been careful to make it cultural, culturally neutral. So if you ask them, ask ChatGPT questions about, uh, what do you think about the food of this particular country? It will give you a very generic answer, so as to probably avoid offending uh users, I I guess. And therefore, I think uh the language produced by ChatGPT might be lacking this kind of authenticity while it might have that uh, linguistic authenticity. My two cents. Yeah, yeah. yeah this, is, this is taking me back to, to Bertinoro back in the early 2000s, a very interesting panel there with John Sinclair and Harry Widdowson talking about the role of, 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 of corpora and authentic language. And to this paper by everybody knows missions in 2004, uh, she wanted to talk about authenticated language rather than authentic language. And I, um, I, um, I was I was really uh, interested in, in looking at the examples that that Sylvia mentioned 
uh, and I'm sure that this can be massively useful and it is being used and it will be more and more widely used uh, both in uh, you know just uh, general language learning but also in uh, data driven learning as well but I was thinking um also to some extent um um whether again um uh, you know, there is too much emphasis on the technology. So back in the day, it was the paper uh, uh, technology, paper-based uh, technology. Then it was the corpora. Uh, then it was resources on the web. And now it's chat GPT, by the way, just one of one of the many applications of large language models that we can find out there. It's It seems that this is the only language, uh, large language model out there, but there's, there's at, at, at least According to ChatGPT, there is at least <laughs> I have to to disclose my sources here. Uh, at least uh, twenty something other large language models that uh, I'm sure they will have different things to offer here. So again, mm, you know, this is all technology, and as somebody mentioned in one of the presentations, this DDL as a process driven approach, and uh, I was wondering whether this is where the true value and main value behind data driven learning can be found in the well going back to discovery process uh, that we expect from from language learners so i don't know i think there is fascinating areas to do more research into how to relate process driven learning and i suppose more technology oriented uh, language learning and uh, i i think we've seen quite a few very interesting examples in these in these presentations before so that is that is really inspiring okay Zylvia you have okay just a mic <laughs> because <laughs> I'm forgetting it okay it's just a just a short reaction just let me just remind you that I presented this I I, I was thinking well that it's going to to be uh, you know there there is going to be a discussion about that so I'm, I'm very happy to participate in it um and that once again the, the purpose the, the purpose of the whole thing is that to me uh the DDL let's see the DDL process so observing language learning this technique and so forth um is what what i don't know which presentation maybe several men, presentations also mentioned has been used mainly in tertiary education to generate specialized corporate or to collect specialized corporate to analyze specialized corporate to analyze for example discourse moves and so forth and what i wanted to say about chat gpt is that or or for, for like any any kind of graded you can you can see it also as a graded reader let's say what what's uh, what the gpt proposes is what do you do with languages that have very little very few resources um what do you do when you want to really introduce the technique and the method to 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 learners at the beginner level so that because I, I have a lot of students that I well I, I try to do it at B2 B2 level or C1 and they said, you know, like all the fast, like I've I've achieved a reasonable level of Hungarian. So why bother now <laughs> with uh, with this complicated surf, you know, complicated interfaces that are not always very nice and very easy to use. So it's just in in this sense that that I think that at that moment, as Alex said, you know, use it when it's appropriate and use it when you when use other tools when other tools are are needed. So it was it was really just to show that there is this potential in the new technology. You can use the data driven learning method with this new technology. Um, but uh, yeah, of course, as, as I also asked the question, like uh, if you accept it as authentic data or semi-authentic data, there is no problem. But I can see also the point if someone says, well, it's artificially generated, so we shouldn't we shouldn't really accept it or we shouldn't really learn with that. I well, my point of view is that that as I I said, I think it's totally. Sometimes it's really not clear if it has been generated or has been authenticated as or or it has been authentic data and for the cultural neut neutrality i think that first of all if you learn a language you don't want to offend anyone so the first thing to learn is actually how to be neutral and polite so i don't think it's really a very 
um, important point in in this um, in this sense. So if you if you want to say, you know, you will not say, what do you think about England? Oh, they only have junk food. Like, this is not the first sentence you want to learn. You want to learn something that it's more, you know, maybe it's a negative opinion, maybe it's a positive one. But but you, you I, 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 my feeling is, or that's me as a language learner also. What I want to want to say is first of all being, you know, being polite in order to connect. And I will stop here because I have like plenty of thoughts. But but I think that's that's enough. <laughs> Don't worry, they are all very interesting contributions are also very very interesting points to raise when when everyone uh is quite as tense as they are uh nowadays uh, and being the the environment so so volatile it's good to keep in mind that maybe you want to to be neutral when you are using your language um so Cecilia, you wanted to say something yes of course I am uh, really agree with uh, Silvia. I don't know that the pronunciation is good. Uh, in my opinion, ChatGPT could be very useful to create corpora for um, language for specific purpose, uh, for example, in mathematics, because uh, um, if you want to, um, for teacher to create corpus is very difficult. Uh, the language of mathematics uh, have uh, text, but also formula, uh, imagine uh, uh, tables, and so on. And uh, ChatGPT only generate text. It's a very useful uh, this aspect <laughs> for uh, for a mathematician. Um, it it could be a possibility. Uh, there is the problem of uh, uh, the correctness of the data, of course. Uh, uh, also for uh, uh, not only for uh, the mathematical language but also for uh, the mathematical concept but it could be a possibility and uh, I think that uh, uh, it could be useful to explore uh, this, uh, this possibility. Great, uh, Elisa? We have also questions in the chat. Yeah, afterwards. This. Okay. okay. Um, so I don't think it's a matter of uh, actually of excitement or of um, you know uh, authenticity of of um, neutrality because you know um, at first stages of of learning language you you do want neutrality you can't really um, uh, just uh, digress. In, in in many idioms and phrasal verbs as English is concerned, as far as English is concerned, or whatever. I mean, the first stage A1 and A2 are neutral as a definition. I mean, you can just squeeze in some, some kinds of slang and whatever. Of course, you can have registers right from the beginning, but still uh, keep it simple. So if you can produce simple text, which are uh, suitable for a level, and observe regularities in these uh, kind of, um, let's say, neutral text, if you want to define as that, that's fine. The problem is that at the moment, we do not have graded corpora. So uh, even scale, let's say scale, which is wonderful, but still, I don't know where the texts come from and how how are they related to the different levels. So graded readers, um, that's good, but, but are not corpora they're not like we, we we should create and have something in between and maybe artificial intelligence can help us in uh, creating a new way of having different materials because the, to me this is the main point that teacher teachers do not want to do ddl because it's mm. time consuming first because they have to learn but also because they do not have the resources ready to use for them so they have to create from scratch that's a question also of, of availability of resources right then and maybe maybe ChatGPT can be that in-between tool to to bridge the unavailability of true corpora and and the one that they need to use for their day-by-day -day, uh practices um jarvis yeah if i if i add a few details on what i just uh, what i said earlier uh, uh, when I when I mean by neutral, it's not that uh, the text will give you like I mean if ask for the opinions of ChatGPT, it's not like neutral as in uh, they will give you a a well worded answer, but rather when you ask them opinions like I just did here, do you like Malaysian food? 
chat GPT give as a machine learning model, I don't have personal preferences or taste. So I don't have the ability to like or dislike anything. So uh, what I'm saying is that over here, it might lack the functional authenticity. Like, I mean, I use extensively chat GPT in my own language teaching. Uh, so what, what, sometimes I find that students have this problem of saying things mm. uh, uh, in an appropriate way. For example, if they want to reject a request, they do not know what is the polite way of doing so. I have a French student who wrote to me saying that he couldn't attend my lecture or uh, my classes. Uh, he wrote, I would like to warn you that I won't be there for your class. You see? So, so it is, uh, this is what, what I mean by, you know, uh, chat GPT might not have this uh, pragmatic sort of a language to, to construct that functional use of the language in a more daily context. That is what I mean by being neutral. Yeah. Oh, I need to clarify on that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Alex. Um, <clears throat> we're looking at the problems of chat GPT, but it has the advantage of it exists. No corpus is going to be ideal either. You think of all the rubbish that you get in corpora, especially corpora which are created by algorithms like um, Mark Davies corpora or Sketch Engine corpora. <clears throat> they're not perfect. They're a good thing. But they're not perfect. One thing comment I particularly like from Mark Davies was when people were talking because he he modelled coca originally on the British National Corpus, the BNC, and the BNC they had a large team of people on a large budget. And they had a company which demographically sampled the population and they sent people out with uh, Walkman to record conversations. Great. In Coca, you don't have that. So people were saying, oh, Coca is not as good as the BNC. I mean, why aren't you doing this? We said, well, I haven't got the money. But if I haven't got the money, either I can do nothing or I can do the best I can with what I've got. So either you have Coca with no spoken component at all or else you have the not perfect spoken component but it exists it's the same with GPT. it won't be perfect but it exists if it's good enough for the purposes that you want why not i'd rather it was better of course but when you've got languages with so few resources or a particular level or something else it won't be brilliant but it might be useful all the same sorry jarvis <laughs> <laughs> uh Zilvia. Yeah, just very briefly uh, um, to, to Jarvis about the uh, neutrality and, and I think that's that's really a very, very good point and uh, with with the large language models like with, okay, let's say, let's stay with ChatGPT for today, um, is that um, you can, you can, you can do, you can, you can, for example, say like what would, how would um, a person react um, if I don't know, um, if if you like Malaysian food, how do you how do you express it and you write it in your in your language? So I think it's it's just a matter of of how to how to word things in order to get as as Alex said again acceptable results. So we are not I think we are not going for something that's that will be perfect because um, and that's also very true in uh, when I train teachers and we do corpus use like they are very happy to have um, a, a graded corpus that we have for Hungarian because they say well in an authentic corpus even I'm totally lost even if it's that as user friendly as 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 um, a sketch engine for example where the tools are really easy and and you don't have to you know um, do much besides clicking on on on, on certain buttons um, but it's yeah, it's it's very interesting, and I don't I don't know the answer to the to that. I mean, what wh where you can use what because we are still, I, I think with the new technologies also we are still experimenting, and and we don't know what what comes and and how how it can be used in different ways. But but I think it's certainly it can be like a, an in between step, as I think Alisa suggested. Mm -hmm. Julia. Yes, there is a question in the the to end answer of uh, Cesare Zanka, and uh, I'm really agree with uh, with him uh, because it uh, he says uh, we students uh, in the next few months just uh, ask ChatGPT about uh, using the examples. Um, my my start my my reflection is uh, we. The, the planning of the activities uh, that uh, I presented in the slides uh, are the most difficult part of my PhD research. Uh, and uh, it's very, very simple to 
uh, ask to chat GBT what are the verbs that are uh, function as object and chat GBT uh, know the answer is not a perfect answer because uh, I I I could uh, I don't could uh, I don't decide what are the verbs as a result I don't have the control of the data uh, but uh, he said the verbs he said the examples and uh, it is a starting point is uh, very difficult is very different from um, our research but uh, uh, is very useful for uh, for teachers and students it's very it's very difficult uh, uh, ask to teachers uh, to develop uh, all the activities uh, that uh, we have proposed um, yeah. Yeah. um so uh what i wanted to say is that uh, yes for sure they can ask chat gpt but they don't even need to ask chat gpt to know how about the usage of examples of uh, uh stare per infinito stare più gerundio they can just literally search it on the google uh because they're it's a like the rule the um uh, deductive the deductive kind of rule like i explain what the rule is and you apply it that you will find it super easily you don't really need to go and ask um, chat gpt data level learning uh, um as uh, another um as other values as other um the other uh how do you say um aims you know than uh, simply learning the rule uh, uh, even though you can actually use it like that as well uh, and that opens another um another kind of win uh, of the topic but yeah for sure you can ask chat gpt but you can also use the web or your grammar group so for some things uh, it's not even needed to resort to artificial intelligence so that's what i think well, I was I was reading uh, what Professor Bolton uh, wrote in the chat here. Uh, 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 an excerpt asking um, asking ChatGPT to to simulate. It depends on uh, and how you approach the queries in in, in the tool, right? Uh, with what's known as um, prompt engineering. It depends on how you ask the tool. Uh, they will provide you with with a more specific answer that might uh, be uh, more fitting for you. So you don't ask the tool what they what it wants, what it prefers in in Malaysian in in terms of Malaysian food, but you ask it to to simulate a conversation asking about who which which Malaysian dish they like best, and they and it will provide that all the same. So it all. It all comes to knowing how to use the tool correctly, which is the basis of every uh, every tool that has come to our uh, uh, to to our tool set, right? And also sometimes using them in combination, you know, mm -hmm. like it's not like if you yeah, they're not exclusive. You cannot use any mm -hmm. of them, like what Jenny was saying, mm -hmm. you can actually support your learning with different technologies and integrate all of them to depending on what you want to learn, how you want to learn it. Um, so absolutely. Uh, there's also a question for Alex, uh, if you could elaborate a little bit more on the specific aspects in uh, which you believe uh, the approaches to chat GBT and uh, the data learning differs. Can you see it? It's on the q &A? Okay. I raised my hand for a different point. I had a question I wanted to ask Jenny, but it's connected to what you were just saying. We uh, we have to use the appropriate tools. Mm -hmm. Jenny had math students, and they had to use ANCOG. Um, they, they, they seemed to say it wasn't a problem with downloading, with uh, uploading their own corpus or the corpus which was provided. Um, did they watch the tutorials? How were they trained to use it? Because they're maybe not particularly keen on investing time. Jenny, was it? It's Cecilia, excuse me. Um, Cecilia. Um, I just wonder how they got on with that. And if you, if there were any problems that they had using 
and Kong because normally it's people say, oh, it's too time consuming. Yes, I collected some data um, from their questionnaire and also um, the, the interview, interviews with local participants. And some of them said that they did thought um, using NCON and especially using NCON and NCON and uh, NFIRE converter to um, convert it, their um, PDL files in computer science to into text files and clearly clearing the data. These these are very com consuming, time consuming. But um, because they are computer science majors, and uh, some of them some of them wrote um Python script to clean the data. So they have some special knowledge um, to deal with the data. Even even that is the case, they still think that this is time consuming. But um I think I think this is a very special um, group of participants, so they may not be um representative to participants in other studies who are not um specialized in computer science because they they have some special knowledge in computer science, so they they didn't fear it is too difficult to learn and the software, and even clear clearly clearing the data. But um, mm -hmm. I do I think ask Lynn Plower, she, she had more success with her engineering students within than than she did with arts and humanities students. So it might appeal to a certain type of profile or an engineering student. It's not just an engineering student, but they think about. The world in a different way to yeah, a language yeah. student. Uh, that's true. Student. That's true. That's true. I think um, when I taught this particular group of students, I found that they they can transfer everything to codes. Even sometimes they they want to respond to me and they code their responses. And then I when I because I conducted um, blended teaching, so I have um, combined face-to-face -face, um, teaching with the online teaching and sometimes they just type their responses into one two three to represent to represent their choices so mm -hmm. they code everything they yes that's true they think everything in a very different way from other students it's, it just it seems to me i don't know what other people's experiences are but if you're introducing a tool it should be mm -hmm. a tool that you can use immediately with five minutes training you can do more later on you can watch all the yeah. tutorials from Ancon. that's fine but it's not necessary i mean do you do much really basic immediate corpus use or do you do you think that training is really important before they can start everybody because i i i didn't just, just train them to use the software well i also taught them um some concepts and uh um uh, the with some discourse materials because I um, I adopted um, Maggie Chow's approach, which combines the uh, co the corpus based approach with the discourse based approach. So I use some discourse materials to inform them what hedges, boosters, edit markers, and self mentions are, and then ask them to use corpus to uh, corpus data to compare um, the frequency of and these dense markers across disciplines and across sections. So I, I ask them to complete a lot of tax, um, tasks, not just to simply to teach them to use the corpus. So this, the training of the software well was integrated into uh, uh, the whole course lasted uh, eight weeks. That doesn't mean I spent eight weeks just training them to how to use the software well. Um, because I what about other people, what, what are your experiences? Um, I might relate on to Cecilia's experience as well. Okay. Um so uh, basically we had no problems. We we we, we um did um the uh, action research for Cecilia's uh, PhD in two secondary schools. So people aged 16 more or less, right, Cecilia? Was a yeah, third year. And they had no problem, absolutely no problem with that. So we presented Ankonk, we told them some basic linguistic, well, features. So what a collocation is, what a left context, context is, what a right context is, and how to read the text. 
And then actually Cecilia prepared the, cor the corpus. The corpus was ready to use. So she, she collected a series of texts on functions and uh, she gave her the, the, the students the, te the text, so the text uh, files. They uploaded them and they started reusing Ankong right from the beginning. So they really had no problems. And after a while, it was a bit difficult at the beginning. So a lot of scaffolding or what we uh, just going through the class and saying, okay, just open this, open. Well, my main problem was uh, teaching them to, how to open two screens for the one of the <laughs> questions, the second for, for the corpus was not the 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 the, the manager managing the, the tool was managing the two windows open on, on a screen. Uh, but then after after a while, after one lesson, I think they, they just uh, took off. I mean, no problem. And they liked it a lot. Uh, so my, now I think we are just um, thinking as we were the teachers, but the, the, the variable there are also the teachers because we can use data-driven learning at ter ter tertiary level, but still what is missing is teacher training for that. Once teachers are trained, yeah, unless otherwise doesn't work. Thank you, Pascual. Uh, just a uh, briefly uh, comment here on, um, um, I sometimes run workshops for either teachers or, or researchers. And I remember just uh, probably a year ago, I did this workshop using uh, Ankong. And uh, it was just uh, two months or three months after the release of the new version, which I think we will all agree that is excellent in terms of research-oriented uh, process. And But for general users, and I'm thinking about English teachers here, that new version was so complicated to make sense of. For them, it didn't make any sense to sort of create like a database and then draw in on the database to retrieve the. So for them, it was so much easier to go fall back on the previous version of Ancom. You simply open the, the files, boom, there, there you go. So you can search instantly. So I was thinking that again, depending as uh, Alex mentioned and uh, also Elisa before, you just got to think about the uh, sort of profile of the users very carefully uh, in terms of, of the tools that you maybe want to suggest or, or use and so on. And also, uh, I, I want to say something about Jenny's research. Uh, she is using over 100 uh, students. So if I remember well, Alex, in your latest paper with uh, uh, Nina Vyatkina, you mentioned that the average, which is a good thing, is increasing from 30 something to 50 something participants in research. So this is a very interesting deployment in data-driven learning that we are probably uh, in probably more and more uh, language learners. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 this is a massive topic, I think, yeah. You have. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I kind of lost track of the of the thing I wanted to say. But um, mainly, if uh, even if something is a little bit complicated at the start, if it's really useful, then uh, um, it doesn't have to be over complicated. There must be uh, some some sort of a balance uh, of between what it could be perceived as something. Uh, a little bit difficult to use. It's something which is uh, absolutely useful. I don't know why I'm watching your screen. We're watching mine. Um, so basically, if you um, let's say there's lots of people, not of our generation, but generations before us, that didn't know how to use a smartphone, how to connect on a certain uh, on an online dictionary. Basically, let's say an online dictionary. Um, and then somehow when they found out that the tool was actually doable, they learned how to go and search for stuff, they started using it. It's just a matter of uh, giving a little bit of time and having the right affordances with technologies. It must be, uh, there must be a balance um, between them, I think. So, yeah. yeah, related to that, I, I guess I have my own two cents on this. Um, but we, because we moved to the um, issues of teacher training 
and how the ones that need to drive the, the uh, progress of education are the ones that need to be aware of how to correctly use these kinds of tools. But then another question arises, and this is one that I found when I was gathering data for, uh, for a study, and we were interviewing um, secondary education teachers and, and uh, adult education teachers. And they said, okay, core prize is nice. This is good. Knowing how language works is useful and certainly interesting. But my students, they want something else. If I sell them the idea of, yeah, you will use this tool that is at first quite complicated to use, but it doesn't have a direct uh, quick impact in your uh, primary objectives, let's say, past the exam. So how do you think DDL, by extension, the use of these kind of tools that are related to DDL, how can they help with the um, daily routine of language teaching and learning process? Uh, maybe fitting into the curricula or maybe uh, helping achieving certain very specific objectives. Yes, Silvia. Yeah, I, I just, it's a first hand experience and again, no studies has been, have been done uh, about that, but uh, um, to answer the question, like how, how students react or how, what, what could be a good way to introduce them to, to Corpora again, um, I, I I will repeat what I've just repeated to to start from there that that I think that DDL if if we take it really seriously I think that that we should really introduce it as as early as possible so we shouldn't wait until they are able they are in tertiary you know university and and so forth and what I find works quite good is that I I published a book um, like a graded reader this year actually. And uh, there are corpus, and and there is that comes with an open corpus that can they can they can search in um, on on um, on Sketch Engine, and um, and there are questions based on there are some concordance lines also presented and as concordance lines, but in the book, and there are also some questions where you have to look look for example how the word good is used in your corpus. So and and apparently that's what my colleagues say. And I must say there must be also a, like a generational issue that younger learners they they immediately get it and they are into it. I mean it's it's a very rough generalization and maybe it's not entirely true either. But but uh, sometimes the students understand, especially younger students understand it even better than the colleague and the colleague learns then from them. Like <laughs> they say, oh, it's it's a good tool. Have you seen you can do this and that and. So that's that's a feedback I I got from there, but basically so integrated in, into a curriculum into the material so that it becomes like apps and videos, something that we naturally go to when we need to answer a question. And I think uh, until it's as long as it's only a, a tool that you learn if you go to certain specific trainings. And and you are not even sure at the end that you are able to use them well. And as a teacher, you don't want to blame yourself in front of your students, say, "Oh, I don't know how to, you know, how to do this or how to do that." So a kind of gentle, soft approach. Uh, I think we we really need this, and and I don't see it much happening actually in in the DDL world. I don't know if you know about any, um, I mean, any, any studies or anything that has been. Has been done where when people try this not at university but really at lower levels and and with what success um i wanted to say that uh, with jarvis we uh, we starting from the notion of uh, normalization after an experiment last year we were um, actually saying just that if you introduce uh, if you start using ddl uh, basically as one of the um uh, let's say toolbox that you have you know right so you have lots of different ways to learn something one is to go check a dictionary and you do it automatically uh one of the most basic things we do when we don't know what to what word to use or what preposition to use with a verb is just go and look on google first example okay good so 
if you start uh, thinking of DDL as uh, an automa automatized, automatized? Uh, normalized uh, tool uh, in your language ex learning experience, uh, you will start looking at it uh, from a completely different, uh, in a completely different way. All right. So, uh, and I guess uh, I, I wanted to to throw this question from the beginning, um, but I, I guess this is the, the quite the, the most important one. My opinion. So, uh, well, of course, um, it's basically related to, generally speaking, how do you all think uh, DDL can be better? How, what can we all do to ensure DDL stays relevant in the overarching plan in the over? <laughs> in the uh, overall uh, field of, of uh, scientific discussion. Expert starts. <laughs> start. <laughs> I just throw the question. Does someone pick it up? Or someone, or someone in the chat, like, because <laughs> this is heavy. This is why this is the heavy one. This is big. Um, define better, Carlos. What do you mean by better? <laughs> uh, it's subjective information. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think you you mentioned how to make sure that we stay relevant. Um, we we, uh, well, you know, I suppose DDL research, in the way we've done DDL research, uh, uh, for thirty years or so. Well, I think I think we are we are on the on the right track. I mean, I think having this conversation is is really um, one of the one of the ways in which we can we can make sure that uh, we are aware of alternative uh, tools or technologies to cooperate, I suppose. And we really need to understand uh, how this is going to impact language learning, it, not just you know today, but in the in the forthcoming, in the forthcoming two, three, four years, and I'm sure that there will be lots of special issues on ChatGPT and similar stuff going on um, very soon. So, I think number one is to have this kind of conversation where we really need uh, to to approach and learn from other contexts and experts and language teachers and also language learners, is to to try to find out. Uh, what is the best to use or, or what other uses can we find for related uh, language learning and discovery sort of uh, approaches. So uh, for me, that is enough. Uh, 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 maybe there is, there, there's more things that we can do, but that, that is one of the good things that we could uh, start doing. Alex. Um, I was thinking when, when... DDL came along about 1990. Sort of, apparently, some people were doing it earlier, but Tim Johnson, 1980, 1993, why data driven learning? It sounds horrible, but it was such a, a weird, different kind of approach. I mean, at the time, in the 80s and 90s, if you wanted to learn a language in a foreign language context, you went to class. Maybe you had materials in a library or a language resource center. Maybe you could buy a newspaper. Maybe you could travel. It's really, really limited. Today, everybody has access to the web. So it's changed the, the, the context within which we have data-driven learning. There are so many things out there which are similar. Um, Alessandra and Jarvis both mentioned Uglish. It's not a corpus, but you're, what you're doing is you're using a tool to search for language in context and seeing multiple examples, or in this case, seeing and hearing multiple examples. Great. I mean, there are all kinds of tools that are out there. Um, I don't think we should try to, I mean, th th there's always been a debate amongst the TALC community about whether we should train students in the terminology of corpus linguistics. Um, I'm not convinced. I think terminology is useful as far as it goes. I mean, Jenny, you were talking about hedging and that kind of thing. That's useful, for, but not for corpus linguistics purposes. I don't see any need for them to know the word concordance if they can just see an example or a context for example so any any tools simple tools that are available and there are hundreds of them you can use google mm -hmm. why not 
and of course chat <laughs> but there's also the the fact that many dictionaries already use uh keywords in context to uh to provide further uh, information about the word you're uh looking for right uh so in in a way for price of already... encourage students to look at the example dictionary mm -hmm. Yeah, examples you use are, are essential for that, yeah. And the chat was also saying that, uh, in a, Cesare uh, was saying uh, that maybe we could uh, um, basically have a database of ready-made materials for teachers, right? Mm -hmm. So to kind of bridge this gap. Um, materials uh, for teachers are important because they have already so much to do and sometimes it can be taxing for them to add something. So, Elisa. Yes, just to, to add something to what Pasquale and Alex said. My students, for example, they uh, at this point, um, I had a survey among them. They use more reverse than word reference as online um, reference for well, our dictionaries. So they basically do some DDL without knowing it. So with my yeah. more steering, uh, it could be basically what is needed. So students at higher level, they do that already. Lingui. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Lingui. Lingui. I use that too a lot when I need to to, to just like a, a find a, a specific uh, meaning of, of and how it translates to other languages, like uh, the correct translation. Level. That, that's a yeah. high level. The university yes. seems have the feeling they know if what is they are looking for because they don't have the tags that they you know the references <laughs> the dictionary does but yeah so. yeah as you say level it's not just level of language it's level of sophistication in thinking about language a lot of students use google translate which is fine nothing against google translate but it's not a good tool to translate a, what a single word just a single word can have many translations you need the context otherwise it's a dictionary and they don't realize that they just google translate that's their answer Absolutely. Um, that's something uh, I noticed immediately in the SBAC classes. Uh, they, they need to have uh, um, a certain competence in their the language uh, um, level naturally. So they need to know, you know, connotations and stuff like that. Um, Reverso, if they didn't know that it had a section in which you could look at word in context. And when they found out, they were like, really? But this changed everything. And it's actually true because it's so easy uh, to make a mistake. I, when I arrived in France, I didn't speak any French. I wrote uh, something like, uh, uh, sorry for my delay, but like using the word delay in French, which doesn't make any sense um, because that was the first translation. On, uh, on, no, I don't remember for Google Translate, but it didn't make any sense. I just said to look at a reverso in context, I would have known that that wasn't the right word to use in that context. And it's just so easy. And that's what I said before with automati automatizing and normalizing DDL. If we consider that DDL, which also means that we are looking at DDL in a broader sense, if we consider English DDL, those are so many tools. Those are tools, sorry. Uh, those are tools that can help so much uh, with uh, um, making uh, uh, TTL more um, mainstream, let's just say. So there's a question here uh, from Albatul. Uh, she says, I have difficulties in training students to learn words. I have adapted the activities from reading concordances, concordance by Sinclair. Is there any other easy activities for DDL? can be used for uh, training students. Because that raises another, the, the question that we've already commented on, it, which is the lack of availability of ready-made DDL tasks. But the, the other part of that is if, DDL is corpus based exclusively. Um, it's difficult to tailor activities when you don't know who you're telling 
than four, um, if that makes sense. Um, I, I'm not sure, I don't know of any uh, site or of any resource of, uh, that, that provides activities that are uh, ready-made for DDL purposes, because every time I've tried that, I've done them, I've, I've designed them myself, bearing in mind my, my own objectives and my target students' objectives as well. Um, I don't know what the, the panel thinks about this. Depends also on what you intend for uh, uh, EC activities for DDL. Like, do you intend uh, some sort of uh, gap fill? Uh, do you intend something that is already like uh, that way, or do you intend something that is hands on uh, with with some uh, semi uh, hands off activities? Uh, there, there's a lot to do. I suppose you're talking about English, which already gives you, by the way, a pretty good uh, advantage. <laughs> uh, because there's so much more out there, uh, maybe which is not completely ready, but it's easily uh, accessible uh, and easily, um, easily, um, let's say user friendly, user friendly. Um, I wouldn't say like Scooter, but like Scooter is, uh, it's not like user friendly, mm -hmm. but a ready-made material, I can only think of the Lancaster, Lancaster box, is that how it's called? What uh, that volume by Ellen Defoe on Data Driven, uh, which is online, I think. I'm just looking for the address now, and I will copy and paste it in the chat. This okay. could also be a book for um, there. Maybe it's the same. Maybe we talked about this uh, last time. Actually, mm -hmm. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the point in fact is that we're running out of time uh we've taken too much of our uh participants and panelists already so if anyone wants to provide their last uh words on on the matter i want to say thank you to all our presenters thank you to alessandra and carlos for organizing it and the two universities involved and um panelists and all the participants as well. Some great questions coming up, great discussions. It's, it's so good to see young researchers doing this type of thing. I thought all of your presentations were, were really inspiring. Um, lots of food for thought there. So thank you, everybody. Uh, same goes to you, uh, the expert of this uh, webinar, because I think that for us, uh, uh, having the possibility to confront uh, and discuss our ideas with someone who has been uh, working uh, on uh, this uh, um, field a lot will help us hear uh, our clear idea and also stimulate us more to do some research on, mm -hmm. uh, on that. So that's, uh, I think that's uh, absolutely incredible. So thank you very much for. Uh, uh, for coming, for joining us. Uh, uh, hopefully it was uh, useful also for uh, our uh, uh, public. So, um, yeah, there's uh, there's uh, there's lots of uh, interaction. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I can go, we can go to lunch. So sorry for yeah. taking, uh, <laughs> we're in Spain at the moment. So, you know, Spain. Lunch is coming yeah. later. Um, but maybe some tapas uh, to, to like, kill the time. For free, for free, no. But thank you so much for participating. It has been a great response uh, so far. Um, and especially thanks to all our uh, panelists who have been so kind as to, to, to lend their voices and faces to, for, for this webinar to be able to, to function. Uh, so I guess that's it. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, have a great day. Hopefully, we will have uh, an occasion to to meet face to face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See you in conferences. <laughs> you. Bye bye. 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 You. See you at talk. <laughs> you maybe yes. Yeah. I would. I would say that.